Hello and welcome to Tremaine Sci-Fi Hour. Today we are discussing author biographies, which is a fancy way of saying Jake's going to tell us some stories about some sci-fi authors. Uh, Jag, starting off, uh, I think you wanted to talk about Heinlein and um, who else? Uh, Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, yes. The one with the PhD in... Uh, well, let's start off with that, yeah. Uh, Jag, Dr. Smith... What was he a doctor in? Chemistry. Ah, oh, yes. Um, okay. And what did he get uh, his PhD in? Well, his undergraduate thesis was, quote, some clays of Idaho. Uh, co-written with a classmate of his, Chester Fowler Smith. Not known if they're related. <laughs> uh, and who later died the following year of TB. TB will come up again this episode. Tuberculosis. Um, yes. To be fair, it was 1914. So he would have died in, in Verdun if he had In 1915. Died. Yeah, yeah. Um, was was so, he American? Yes. Well, then he wouldn't have died until 1917. <laughs> uh, the, the person who wrote the thesis, Some Clays of Idaho, was indeed a mirror, <laughs> Mr. Tremaine. So, I wanted to talk about Edward Elmer Smith, uh, yes. aka E. E. Smith, PhD, and E. E. Doc Smith. I want to talk about him specifically because he is the author who got me into sci-fi. I first met him. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he died in '65. I never met him. Um, Thanks, Jim. I, as as a young child, maybe about twelve, I received most of his works. Um, eighty percent of the uh, Family D'Alembert series, which he didn't write, uh, as well as all of Lensman and Skylight. Right. I did not get uh his awful Lord Ted. Uh, works. So, he is widely credited with inventing space opera. Right. Um, he wrote the first real work of space opera in 1920. So, people no. consider early space opera to be Flash Gordon, 1936, Star Trek, 1966, and of course Star Wars, 1977. Well, hold on, but there, there are also other works of space opera, aren't there, that were made before he, re that were published before he published in 1928. So, he finished writing his first uh, work in that series in 1920. Okay, so... It wasn't published for eight years. Um, Anything? <laughs> his chagrin. Was he like sending them out to publishers that entire time, or was he just? Did he just like the write it? Entire in? time. He, Jesus Christ! Uh, piece of trivia is he spent more on postage than he received for the book. Um. <laughs> sorry, that was the case for Skylark, his first real work. Right. Um, that one he spent more on postage than he received for the book. He received a hundred and twenty-five dollars in nineteen twenty-seven, which, like, boy, um, that's about two thousand US dollars these days, and he spent right. more than that on getting the book <laughs> to publishers, who all said, "We love it. Uh, we think the readers won't get it." It's it's too much for them. Um, all those people proven wrong because boy oh boy, Skylark, Lensman, they just classics. Um, so Skylark was his space opera work, and Lensman was the only work he personally considered to be science fiction of his. He made a clear delineation between his space opera and his science fiction. For him, science fiction had to be plausible. Space opera is just 
war and romance in space. Uh, right, so the sort of more theatrical science fiction like sci- uh, like Star Wars, Star Trek and Flash Gordon, where the um, focus is more on characters and uh, flashy sort of things rather than the focus is on science or the scientific yeah. theories or things like that. Now, now, of course, we consider um, space opera to be a subset of science fiction. Right, which is itself uh, a subset of speculative fiction. <laughs> yeah, a term either coined or popularized by Heinemann. I think possibly coined. Um, Heinemann being the other author I want to get into because a uh, friend of Dr. Smith's um, and another person whose work I read quite early. Now, Doc Smith's background is very interesting. He was born to a Presbyterian farmer and farmer's wife. Um, His mother was a teacher. His father was varyingly a sailor, a farmer, all sorts of things. Um, Smith himself uh, started as a manual labourer. Right. Uh, had to stop that after he injured his wrist fleeing from a fire at the age of 19. <laughs> it's, uh... The times were different. <laughs> uh, as I said, he co-wrote a thesis on what clay is like in Idaho. Uh, he was at the University of Idaho. <laughs> he did end up getting two degrees in chemical engineering. And whilst at university, he was president of the chemistry club, the chess club, the mandolin and guitar club, captain of the drill and rifle team, and you like this one, Jermaine, he was the bass lead in his university's Gilbert and Sullivan (laughs) optics. Shut up. (laughs) Oh, you like Gilbert and Sullivan, don't you? Yeah, I do. I like Gilbert and Sullivan. (laughs) Fun. It's, uh, accessible. But yes, um, he also ended up having three children, um, one of which Robert Heinlein dedicated his novel Friday uh, to one of uh, Smith's children, Verna Jean. He, when he left university, he worked, or college, I guess. I don't understand the American naming system for school. I don't think uh, anyone does. He became a chemist for the National Bureau of Standards in Washington. Now, what would you expect uh, his focus to be when working there? Obviously, standards. Well, yes. Um, well, I... Standards for what? Well, for chemistry. <laughs> Chemicals. Butter. And oysters. Well, I suppose those have chemicals, <laughs> as do um, as does everything. But so yes, uh, his job as a chemist at the National Bureau of Standards was to develop standards for butter and oysters, not buttered oysters. The two things separately. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, and then he continued his education at George Washington University. Um. World War One, as many of you will know, broke out. Uh, he wanted to be a pilot. He said, I want to fly a Jenny. Um, he got a response saying, there aren't enough chemists. We need you to be a chemist, please. <laughs> uh, he, His personal belief, which he shared, was that the planes were too expensive. They didn't want him to crash one. <laughs> he then... Uh, instead was sent to the Commission for Relief in Belgium. Now, Tremaine, do you know much about the Commission for Relief in Belgium? No, not really. Herbert Hoover created this commission and basically their task was to get food from America to Belgium and France. Right. A noble undertaking. Um, 
because Belgium had been occupied and yep. Germany, the occupiers, were taking all of the food for their soldiers. Right. Um, problem being that Belgium, at best, only made 25% of its food needs. And Germany were taking all of it. The amount is ridiculous. They shipped 5.7 million tons of food in the end. Jeez. Mainly flour, some rice and sugar. They sent at least 697 million pounds of flour to Belgium alone. They fed 9.5 million civilians during the war. It was crazy. And so that's what Smith did during the war. Um, as well as being just a chemist. Yeah. Now, this might seem familiar to you. He decided to write a book. I'm sure that sounds familiar to you. <laughs> yeah. Um. What's interesting, and I found out when researching this, is I, I knew that the two main characters were uh, Seton and Crane. Um, last names, Seton. The Setons and the Cranes. This is the part that may seem familiar. He lived in the Seton Place apartments. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the names for things he took from just stuff near him. Yeah, that does sound familiar. <laughs> sound familiar? <laughs> Someone, someone once said, and this this will link in with it, is that George Lucas was looking at a um, paperclip when he designed a lot of the ships. Uh, sorry, not a paperclip, a um, bulldog clip. Um, when, oh yeah. When he was designing all the ships, <laughs> like because if you look at if you look at them, they they sort of have like I'm holding one right now, and it sort of looks like the um, Republic gunship. It looks like. If you fold out one arm like this, it looks like a B wing. If you fold out one arm like that, it looks like a it looks like an X wing as well, without the other X. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> Does any of it look like a twin ion engine fighter? Shut up. <laughs> That's what Tie Fighter stands for. <laughs> um. So yeah, he just named things after things near him. Yeah, like Barris Offy, which was clearly Barista Coffee. <laughs> um, so he was writing the story about interstellar travel right. um, ended up being the first uh, story as far as we can tell ever written where people leave the solar system right okay um, yeah I suppose he was, I suppose he was on the very verge of when we started to realize there was more than us, right? Yeah, I mean, this was 1915. So it's 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 an early time to be doing just about anything. I mean, some people point to some early French works like uh, Les Postumes or Star au Ci de Cassiope, Histoire Marvelous de l'un de Mondes. De l'espace. Obviously butchered those, I don't speak French, but those <laughs> two stories are from 1802 and 1854. Jesus. They're not really considered space opera, they're considered future war fiction. Right, okay. Um, so there is previous works that cover um, interstellar combat, but it always happens in our solar system. Right, yeah. It's always the aliens came to us. Whereas in his... No, Kitty. In his um, Skylark, they went to them. They made a ship that can fly using uh, transuranic elements fusing together to make power. Again, this is 1915. Uh, <laughs> he is one of the people who got questioned by the FBI. <laughs> uh, 
Apparently you shouldn't be talking about nuclear materials. We don't talk about nuclear materials. <laughs> Not in the 1920. <laughs> Very weird. Um, but yes, um, the wife of his friend and ex-classmate, um, Dr. Carl Garby, his, his wife, Lee Hawkins Garby, um, helped quite strongly with the romantic elements because being a young lad of help me out here 27 uh he wasn't good at writing romance um she's often described as being brought in to spice it up um it's a very rude way of looking at it she co-wrote it right yeah she was a significant part of it. Um, the drafts that were sent to editors, you know, written, you know, written by E. E. Smith and Lee Hawkins Garvey. She was considered equal by him. Um, when it eventually got published, she was taken off the cover and just put on the, um, like the title page instead. Um, her relevance, her importance has been widely dismissed um, unfairly. That's the last time we'll hear of her, but I just wanted to point out that... <laughs> well, didn't you... When we were researching this... Book. When we were researching this show, we also discovered something about her Wikipedia page, didn't we? <laughs> oh, yes, her Wikipedia page. So, um, you know, first paragraph, it's just two lines. Um, it says that uh, she helped write Skylark of Space, the first science fiction story in which humans left the solar system. She's the wife of Dr. Carl DeWitt Garvey, Dr. Smith's friend. Second paragraph, um, it's just about the book. <laughs> and then when it comes to the only other section of life, it is one line about when she was born, when she died, her children... Uh, and then it's four paragraphs about her husband, <laughs> Dr. Garby, who frankly did a, just about uh, nothing. <laughs> he did pretty much nothing in life. Um, I mean, you know, he had some kids, he worked with Dr. Smith professionally and in college. Um, but he died in 1928 um, due to workplace exposure to chemicals. He was also a chemist. Um, but yeah, it's it's even her Wikipedia page talks more about her husband. Um, Dr. Does. Smith himself always acknowledged her always listed her as Mrs. Garby. M-R-S dot Garby. Always was like, she is a lady. She helped me write this. She was great. He had nothing but respect for her and was very specific about pointing out her gender, being like, look, lady science fiction writer, one of the first. I mean, we generally accept um, Mary, Mary Shelley as being science fiction. So not the first, obviously, but certainly early. And it's also the only book she ever worked on. Well, I mean, after all that, <laughs> after all that, I don't think I would want to keep on writing she, either. She was invited to help on um, the later Skylark books in the series, um, but her husband had died, and she was like, "I'd rather not, actually." <laughs> Again, sad. Um, yeah. She was definitely significant in the first third, which was when uh, they put it on hiatus. It says abandoned, but they came, he came back to it, obviously. Uh, he got his master's, de master's degree in chemistry uh, at George Washington University, where he studied under Dr. Charles E. Munro. Now, Tremaine, have you heard the name Charles E. Munro before? It rings a bell, but I can't quite... Uh, so he discovered, I think is the term for when it's a natural 
thing, he discovered the Monroe effect. Named after him. Right. Now, if you click Monroe effect on Wikipedia, it comes yeah. up with the page for shaped charge. He invented shaped charges for uh, explosives. Oh. Uh, Smith described him as, and I will quote, probably the greatest high explosives man yet to live. And at that time, 1917, there's a good chance it was true. He probably was. He changed the course of explosives. Amazingly. As I said, he, he invented shaped charges. He he basically made torpedoes plausible. Right. Um, it, it's crazy. And that's that was Doc Smith's teacher, for his professor. Um, which makes it strange that his PhD dissertation was <clears throat> the effect of bleaching with oxides of nitrogen upon the baking quality and commercial value of wheat flour. Otherwise titled, The Effect of the Oxides of Nitrogen Upon the Keratin Molecule C40H56. Basically, it was, if you beat bleach flour, what's it do to donuts? <laughs> what what effect does different degrees of bleaching and different bleaching agents have on donuts? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what he was a doctor of. Of donuts. <laughs> he was a doctor of donuts. And flour. <laughs> um, which makes sense that he then left... He got his PhD, he left university, he became the chief chemist for F.W. Stock and Sons, uh, the largest family-owned mill east of the Mississippi, where he worked on donut mixes. <laughs> um, as much as I want to talk about his donut career extensively, I do want to sort of steer us back into... Uh... Okay, we'll, we'll get off um, the subject of uh, donuts and food. Uh, with one final thing, which is he developed the first viable process for getting sugar to stick to donuts. <laughs> it was the early well, you, century. You could invent these things. You could invent these things. <laughs> uh, so, yes. Um, would that be... Yeah. Three years after he had given up on his story, he was babysitting for a friend um, while his wife attended a movie without him. Um, and he went, this is boring, kids asleep. Wasn't I writing a book? <laughs> <laughs> Spent a year uh, finishing his book, submitted it. Um, again, paid more on postage than he got paid for it. Um, and set a record for the highest paid uh, author at the time. Yeah. Uh, three quarters of a cent per word. Ooh, yeah, we get paid one cent a word now. And that's ah, there's usually this a was, limit. <laughs> this was three quarters of a cent American in 1930. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we get paid less than... <laughs> Uh, we nearly get paid the same amount, and it was also worth more. Oh, God. Well, uh, inflation is roughly, uh, that would come to about 10 cents a word oh. uh, in New Zealand's money now. Um, so he, he wrote some more works, of course. Uh, in 1938, he wrote a novel, um, what he called his only real work of science fiction. Uh, I'll, I'll get the quote. It was, this was really scientific fiction, not, like the Skylarks, pseudoscience. <laughs> it was his only work of true science fiction. Uh, the fans hated it. <laughs> Um, apparently they thought it was not exciting 
because it took place entirely in our solar system because the science of the time didn't really allow for going even speculating go leaving the solar system in a realistic manner um he got two cents a word for that oh oh god yes <laughs> what has happened uh, to the writing industry <laughs> He was then told to write a book. Uh, don't care so much about the science, just have fun with your imagination. Uh, so he did. He made a semi-satirical novel uh, where the characters in the novel point out the uh, psychological and scientific absurdities that are happening in the novel. Um, wow. Breaking the fifth, the fourth, and the second wall. <laughs> Uh, and they loved it, um, but the timing was bad, and he got half a cent a word. Very sad. Um, there was a new editor at Astounding who went, oh, I'll buy it for a cent a word. And he was like, oh, I've just sold it for half that. He went, oh, well, uh, write more Skylark then. Smith had not been expecting to write more Skylarks. He felt it had been finished with the second book, so he tried to write a third. He he couldn't. Uh, well, he did, uh, but he felt he'd lost his mojo. He sent a first draft to the author, F. Orlin Tremaine, or the editor, rather, sorry, F. Orlin Tremaine, along with a letter saying, to paraphrase, I don't know what I'm doing, Please help. I um, <laughs> fi fix this. What do I need to do? Uh, to which to Tremaine to accepted it, gave him $850, said thank you, and immediately published. To be fair, I've sent you a message to that effect as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I didn't give you the equivalent of 10 grand. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, of 10 grand, and immediately published it. <laughs> Well, why couldn't you, Jag? <laughs> um, so then he was, you know, here he is, science fiction author, um, master, well-known, everyone loves him. Uh, so he took a, do a job at a donut company <laughs> where he worked 18-hour days, seven days a week for almost a year. Oh, um, God. Until he was <clears throat> dislocated from his job due to uh, pre-war rationing. Basically, there's no market for donuts. You can't sell donuts anymore. Um, <clears throat> so he lost his job. So he decided to write a police cops and robber novel, <laughs> uh, which apparently you are allowed to make and sell during the war. Um, and people loved it that that became lensman it's been an animated movie um it's great it goes a little weird in the last uh book something that he has in common with highland going a little weird at the end <laughs> um, we'll get into that <laughs> um basically it had a lot of eugenics oh uh it had multi well there's an two alien races one good one bad the cops and the robbers basically and each of them had separate eugenics programs on earth ah uh, the good mm. eugenics and the bad eugenics um well i mean to be fair what year was this uh 37 i believe so it still hadn't it still hadn't. It was still pretty much policy in America and most of the world. Oh yeah. So. Um. Well, let, let, let's put it this way. Um, in the last book, like it ends with the four children of the main characters being like eugenic genetic perfections. Uh, and obviously that means that they should mate with each other to make a new breed of Superman. Um, <coughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no. Very Heinlein. Um, 
Oh, now, no. where I want your opinion is his writing style for that series to me seems weird. Okay, go ahead. He has in his mind four books. These right. are the Lensman novels. He wrote an 85 page outline. <laughs> is that reasonable for four books? Um, 85 pages. How long were the books? Uh, full novel length, maybe. Okay. What's that, like 150, 200 pages or something? Okay, so, yeah, uh, it's a little excessive. Okay. Considering you probably won't use it. Um, well, yeah. What? For, for the first <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just Let me just take some theories here, because um, as someone who's tried to write an outline and follow it religiously, let me just take a guess that he uh, got to Chapter 1, and realised that he had completely de deviated from the, from the outline. <laughs> oh, that would have saved him some time. <laughs> okay, uh, what chapter no. did he get to when he... <laughs> he wrote a much more detailed outline of the first book, including a graph of the emotional peaks and valleys. Um, and then he started writing it. His characters didn't do what he wanted to and he had to throw out the outline. So he wrote a second outline for the first typical. book before it went bad. That is typical? Yeah. Okay, I've never really written so, like that, so I, I didn't. So I actually have my outline here for um, the novel I'm writing, and um, I already have... So I wrote this before I went into hospital, and I've already crossed out most of it. Again, apologize for missing a uh, screening of our podcast. <laughs> we missed a we missed a, a, a episode of our podcast due to that. Yeah, and um, so I've cr already crossed out most of it. Mm, um, I've already had to rewrite most of it, and um, yeah, it's it's a it's a real pain in the ass. So. <laughs> It's, it's coming it, from a fellow who usually likes the pain in the ass. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. No, actually, let's not make those jokes. This is a classy podcast. <laughs> the back well, it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yep, go on. <laughs> to be clear, any discussion we have regarding sexual matters in this podcast episode is entirely consensual. Well, also <laughs> something to remember. <laughs> Something to remember is these are writers who wrote during times of interesting scientific yeah. theories. So things like eugenics. Have you ever heard of eugenics? It's essentially the idea that if you breed certain traits in humans, it comes those traits come through, I think, and therefore you could breed a super race of people. Which we was... made breeds of dog. We made breeds of cow. We could do that with humans, right? <laughs> so that sounds great. Massive ethical complications. Yeah. So what we get there is the Nazis. Uh, a lot of what happened to black and um, other minority groups in America, where they were sidelined because they had percep they the society at the time had a perception of how those. Cultures didn't live up to expectation. Um, and there's two main forms of eugenics. There's yeah. what's called... Po We're not talking positive and negative in like an ethical or moral sense, yeah. but in a application sense. There was positive eugenics, which, for example, China was still doing quite recently, <laughs> where it's, hey, if you have an IQ over 120, we'll pay you to have kids. We'll cover your rent. We'll cover your childcare costs. This is good for society to have better citizens. Mm. Um, unfortunately, we know that that doesn't actually lead to necessarily lead to well better, um, quality <laughs> citizens. Well, also, uh, also, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I will just interject there. So, the height they did manage to breed taller people. <laughs> In so. Directors. Much harder. Yeah, so IQ already is problematic. The idea that we can uh, judge someone's... Racist 
at best. <laughs> the idea that we can judge someone's intelligence through a test is interesting. Um, and if you've ever been in a psychologist's office, you know that means bad. Um, and also the idea that nature and nurture don't, you know, aren't fighting for supremacy in terms of psychology is also probably not the best idea. But uh, go on, what's negative eugenics? Uh, negative eugenics is more along the lines of what Nazi Germany and America at the same time did, which is uh, if you have a disability, sterilize. Yeah. Sterilize. yeah. Uh, if you are, I mean, Germany did a lot of just murder. Yeah. Uh, but they also did sterilization. America mainly kept it to sterilizing yeah. people. Uh, some, I have heard people say that it is still kind of happening. Mm. Um, Planned Parenthood, birth control is highly encouraged for racial right. minorities in I would, America. Yeah, but would you say that's the intention of it, or is that the just some of the realities of how how these... Because you know, you know what I'm trying factor. to say. You know what I'm trying to say with how... If you target the poor, you are inherently targeting minorities as yeah. well. Well, but also, also what I'm getting at is if the poor have less children, then the poor have a bit more money. So you can definitely argue that there is a benefit to the individuals and to society. That is still eugenics. Yeah, it's still eugenics, but it's also... I, don't, I wouldn't say it's, it's targeted. I would say it's more of a practicality that's probably not the best idea i mean there's there's better ideas like just improving their life personally i'd say it is targeted but that where i draw the lines is how the degree of compulsion and coercion right okay yeah. if you provide something for free that they want anyway cool if you pressure them into it not cool. <laughs> not cool. Not cool, man. Not cool. Um, um, but also, so so something we should also carry on. So eugenics, bad. Uh, eugenics inspired a lot of what happened in the Holocaust. A lot of what happened was sterilization of black and minority groups in America. It also led to the sterilization of mentally ill people. Um, so, yeah, you can you can see how... It's not a good idea, but at the time it was seen as a solid science, sort of. It, yeah. It's an interesting concept, and without ethical concerns, like if you could discard ethical concerns, it would be certainly like interesting to follow. Any time it's been even touched on, it's be immediately been oppression. Native Australian, uh, First Nations in Canada, Native Americans, African Americans, um, racial minorities in China. Yeah. The German Holocaust. <laughs> the so, Nazi Holocaust. The Germans are by and large the same as everyone else. Yeah. So. Bad, I should be clear. <laughs> So, um, I mean, also just reflecting on that as well is we had a lot of ideas in the 20th century, particularly, that we thought would work. A lot of ideas. Or we thought were worth exploring. Communism, fascism, authoritarianism really took hold in those times, and especially in the early half of the 20th century. Um, we also explored concepts which we thought wouldn't work, but we wanted to be sure. Yeah. Some of them were disastrous. Uh, some of them led to yeah. millions and millions of deaths. But, uh, you know, win some, you lose some. But, uh, yeah, so let's, let's move back to the science fiction so that uh, we sure. can Sure, so I guess off. this episode is just a Doc Smith one. Um, we'll do Heiner next Time. No, no, we've still uh, got time. <laughs> no, we don't, because there's a lot more of Smith. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Carry on. Um, so, you may have heard of Pearl Harbor? Oh, yes, yes, that, uh, that event. <laughs> that kerfuffle, yes. <laughs> um, 
He was one year over the age for reinstatement into the army. Oof. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, he did want to fight. But instead, he went to the Kingsbury Ordnance Plant in Indiana as a chemical engineer. <laughs> Ended up being chief chemical engineer. Uh, where they worked on high explosives, uh, particularly, um, say, artillery munitions. Right. He ended up losing his job there. He was fired in early 1944. Can you guess how the chief chemical engineer gets fired from the his role as head of the inspection division at the Kingsbury Ordnance Plant? Are you going to tell me that one of the artillery pieces blew up and killed a few soldiers? He prevented that from happening. Oh. And was fired. The army needed a lot of shells. They said, do it faster, do it faster, do it faster. They were doing it faster. Being head of the inspection division, he was in charge of quality control. He was seeing more and more substandard munitions come through. He would shut down the plant and say, no, these are going to blow up in the cannons, in the artillery, and kill our men. And the army said, we've run the numbers. For every one explosion, that'll kill, what, three artillery men. For every three lives lost, having those extra shells from you guys working faster will kill more than three enemies. We are willing to make that sacrifice (laughs) of having our munitions sometimes kill our own men. He said he's not willing to make that sacrifice. They fired his ass. Um, That that also happens to a character in one of his novels. (laughs) In great detail, he's clearly the good guy. He has support in the novel. Uh, Smith did not in real life. So he was fired from that. And then spent some years uh, working, uh, making tanks for Alice Chalmers. Heavy tanks. And also farm machinery, because it was now after the war. That was one. <laughs> well, less demand for tanks after the war. So <laughs> also farm machinery. Well, I mean, let's not speak too soon after that war. <laughs> <laughs> well, they still made heavy tanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, when that job ended... He moved into his last job. He worked until his retirement at J.W. Allen & Co., where he was manager of uh, cereal, mixing cereal. <laughs> that is a really weird life. <laughs> he was a food chemist. Still a really so, weird life. So he, he worked at his logistics company where they he did stuff. You know, involving like the fortification of cereals with uh, vitamins and iron. That's what he was good at. He continued to work after his um, retirement uh, on books. Um, again, Robert Heinlein, great friend of his, Heinlein dedicated Methuselah's children to Edward E. Smith, PhD. And um, Heinlein considered Smith to be some sort of bizarre Superman. Um, If you've read Heinlein's work, apparently Lazarus Long is based off Heinlein, which makes sense with the cross-generational sexual things. Um, In in terms of that book I mentioned, uh, Children of the Lens, I personally think that Lazarus Long is more of a self-insert of Heinlein. And it was Heinlein talking about his uh, own personal desires to sleep with his grandchildren. Um, But we'll get to Heinlein, as I said, probably next episode, because we're approaching the end. We're approaching Um, the end. Um, So, um, something... We did write one more work. It was a novella called The Imperial Stars, about circus performers who are actually the... Um, secret forces for the Empire. Right. Uh, they come from a planet with three times the gravity. That's why they're such good circus performers. If you grew up in three times gravity and have a long history 
ancestry of three times the gravity, you become real good at trapeze. Because <laughs> under normal gravity, yeah, you can jump 20 feet, why not? <laughs> um, unfortunately, he only wrote the first book um, or part of the book. Uh, author Stephen Golden to finish the series Family D. Allen Bear. Um, interesting thing with Family D. Allen Bear is uh, he, sorry, Stephen Golden uh, went on to write his own books. Agents of Isis. <laughs> Not that Isis, the interplanetary security something. Uh, Not the Egyptian god or the uh, terrorist organization. Something else. Or the organization in the uh, cartoon series Archer. No. Uh, <laughs> now, what's interesting is he he swears that Agents of Isis is a completely new work, a completely new franchise, no relation to anything he's previously worked on. Uh, for example, the second book in the Family D'Allen Bear series is Strangler's Moon. Uh, the second book in Agents of Isis is Treacherous Moon. <laughs> uh, Clockwork Traitor became Robot Mountain, Getaway World, Sanctuary Planet, The Purity Plot, Purgatory Plot, Planet of Treachery, Traitor's World. Definitely unrelated. <laughs> uh, I haven't read Agents of Isis. I feel like I may have, because I have weird family <laughs> <laughs> Um And then he also finished the Skylark series with Skylark de Quesne. He also, as I said, wrote Lord Tedrick, which is not what I got into. It is about a smith, a uh, blacksmith and whitesmith, living in a small town near a castle in, let's say, England in the 1200s. Right. A time traveller visits him, uh, teaches him advanced metal metallurgy, and then leaves, and Tedric can make better armour. <laughs> yeah, not the most interesting... <laughs> Two books. <laughs> not the most interesting plot, but... Uh... Yeah, I wasn't really that into it, to be honest. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, Edward Elmer Smith, he more or less created space opera. He is called the first of the three novas of 20th century science fiction, um, followed by the second one, Stanley Weinbaum, and the third, Robert Heinlein. Heinlein says that Smith is why he got into writing in the first place. Right. Uh, to quote, I have learned from many writers, from Vernon Wells and Campbell and Sinclair Lewis et al., but I have learned more from you than from any of the others, and perhaps more than for all the others put together. Smith liked creating fictional technologies that weren't, as far as science of the time went, not impossible. But he had this massive love for the really unlikely science fiction concepts. He went, I'll get a quote here, the more highly improbable a concept is, short of being contrary to mathematics, whose fundamation, fundamental operations involve no neglect of infinitesimals, the better I like it. <laughs> yeah. So... He was definitely of the soft science fiction. Um, he was one of the... Lensman was a finalist um, for the 1966 World Science Convention. Uh, Asimov's Foundation won that. Um, best all-time series. So, I say, top... Top five best all time series. Uh, he is in the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. Uh, people have continued on from some of his works. Lensman did 
sort of continue. There was a movie which was weird. Um, and he had it's influenced so many people and was influenced by others. Um, I think the most interesting things is last episode we were talking about technology. Episode before last, I mean. We record out of order. Um, we were talking about <laughs> well, technology we <laughs> that was or came from science fiction. Right. Um, yes, that we was last episode. Yeah. We mentioned that the tank was um, yep. science fiction before it was science. He had the the idea of what the inside of a of a um like so he bleh. <laughs> Smith uh, envisioned something called a tank, but it's not that sort of tank. It uh, later became in real life the United States Navy's Combat Information Center. It's a three-dimensional uh, map of where all your ships are and where everyone else's ships are. Right. Um, it was hugely important in the United States defeating the Japanese Navy. Right, okay, I see what you mean. And yeah, it, it was it was taken almost directly from Lensman. Right. Um, again, he, he was writing post-World War One, but pre-World War II. Um, he was incredibly, incredibly focused on the idea of don't let your enemies know your technology. Hide your technology. So um, I think like when Britain hid radar... Right. They lied yeah. about it through their teeth. It was, no, we're just feeding people carrots, right? Yeah. So, I won't say that they took inspiration from his work uh, in hiding the technology of radar, but, you know, 1920s and onwards, he was just beating that point. If you've got something, don't let them know. Do not let them know. Right, because the closer they'll get to finding it, yeah. Um, and he also, in his um, book, uh, Triplanetary, uh, had terrorists using poison gas. Really? Now, poison gas was already used in World War One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he had pirates use it um, to kill off the crew of a ship. Um, it's a natural extension or assumption that you would go from, you know, using it in war to using it in, you know, crime. Yeah. But it's the last example I'm aware of, certainly. Um, and definitely the earliest uh, description of, well... Skylark of Space uses, and this is the one from 1920. Yeah. The 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 Skylark, the ship. Yeah. Uh, uses a very specific power supply. Right. So transuranic elements uh. separated from platinum group residues using electrolysis. Fusing them together right. in a nuclear process that creates uh. large amounts of energy, <laughs> not too much radioactive waste, um, it, it's written in the same sort of discovery as how x-rays were discovered. Like, hang on, this does this? Oh, could I do this? But he pretty much described cold fusion about 50 years before Stanley Ponce and Martin Fleischmann 
like figured out cold fusion and he had it okay he had this weird focus on platinum with his transuranic elements right and we use uh centrifugal separation to get the heavier uh uranium from the lighter uranium the heavier uranium. i should specify we don't i don't i certainly don't <laughs> um Whereas his idea was heavily based on electrolysis. We at Tremaine Co. don't believe in nuclear material. <laughs> but the description of fusion is pretty much fusion. Interesting. Well, um, that's about all the time we have for that. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this author bio on Doc Smith. It was going to be of three other, two other authors, but... um. We ran out of time because we started talking about eugenics. Because <laughs> we started talking about eugenics. Anyway, um, thank you for listening for this long. Thank I, you for I, listening the, to Jack. Plus side, yeah. On the plus side, our our listeners can look forward to an episode on Robert Heinlein and an episode on Isaac Asimov. Yes, we didn't. Maybe more if we can feel like getting around to Arthur C. Clarke's. Yes, works. I need to read some of his work before we do that, though. Maybe so, George Lucas. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, huh? that'll be fun. Yeah. Um, so yes. So thank you for thank you for listening. Um, you took a lot of influence from Linsman. Shut up. So <laughs> we'll um, we'll catch you next time. Uh, don't forget to check out the Facebook and Instagram pages to keep to be kept up to date with what we're uploading and when we're uploading it. Uh, usually it's at seven a.m. on Tuesday in ZST time. Why did I say time? It's implied in the T. All right. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.